It's not that we don't understand what's going on. It's not that we're perpetually confused. It's more the the shock, the ongoing shock of realising that we've been being fed a version of events which for too long we just consumed without thinking. I often talk or make reference to your know, food and nutrition on here one way or another. And I think there's an analogy there, uh, which, which is to say that we were indifferent to, for so long to the nature of the food that our society offered, you know, in the shops. Uh, indifferent, I think, is the right word. We were unaware of the nature of the junk <laughs> we were being fed and, uh, and you know it's bad for us the, the mass of the food that's mass produced out there is bad for us you know it's full of ingredients you wouldn't want anywhere near you far less to put in your mouth you know, vegetable oils which aren't vegetable oils they're the effluent from they're the side effects of industrial processes all that sugar, sugar in everything. So, you know, the, the food that, that you're invited to eat is bad for you. Well, there's something of that with the, the news and the official sources of information that we are fed. It's full of stuff that's harmful. Stirred in amongst the basic ingredients you actually want is a lot of harmful propaganda and nonsense that you don't want to be consuming. So what are we to make then of so much that is confusing? This morning I saw something on the news, the mainstream news, and there was talk of how inflation's coming down. That number, you know, I don't know, it's whatever, it's gone from seven and three quarters to six and a half, you know that really irritating way that they, they seem to pretend that they can calculate that, that force in, in, in so precise a way. Okay, they say, okay, so they say inflation's coming down, but the prices in the shops remain ruinously high. How does that work? Are costs rising or falling? And, and if, if, as we seem to be being told, the cost of making and producing things is coming down, why aren't the prices? And that's just one thing. That's just one question. And those in authority look at us when we ask those questions as if we're just too stupid to understand. That's, they radiate that sense that you know, I'm not even going to bother addressing your question because even if I did and I'm not going to, you wouldn't get it anyway. And look, what else? You know, the mainstream media was all over stories about terrifying temperatures in the Mediterranean and elsewhere and the predictions by forecasters which were broadcast on mainstream television, on the front pages of newspapers, every other officially sanctioned source of information and data, the predictions by forecasters made it sound like the world was just about to catch fire. I kept on thinking about Fahrenheit 451, you know, that book about the temperature at which paper, i.e. books, spontaneously combusts. You know, that's that's what it felt like. It was just, just about to go. But of course, the predictions missed, often by a mile. Look at Look at the summer we've had here in Britain. I don't know where in the world you might be listening to this, watching this from, but here in Britain, the summer so far has largely been a washout. Uh, it's been unseasonably cool for a lot of the time, and it's been wet. It's summertime, and it feels like it has rained every day or every other day. And yet, having sought to terrify us about a world catching fire, the, the, the official sources of information really don't address the fact that we've had a rubbish summer if they do, they try and brush it away as climate change. The, the rubbish summer we've had here in Britain is just a sort of extreme weather. Another extreme weather effect caused by climate change. That's what they would say. Uh, but I would say it's just the weather. It's just the weather, as it's always been, as it was when I was a little boy. Weather is changeable. Weather is unpredictable. You have good summers and bad, and I don't see that anything... I've just come back from Crete... Right? We had the family in Crete for a week in that Mediterranean. Well, 
in the Aegean, but part of the Mediterranean Sea. And the my kids were watching the temperatures, and it was b- between 30 and 32 degrees every day, and it was lovely. The sky was blue, there wasn't a cloud. Uh, but the week before, or two weeks previously, we'd been being told that the, the temperatures were going to be in the high 40s. It was absolutely insane. We saw nothing like that. And, you know, broaden that out, the, the, the same official sources of information, the mainstream media, was all about wildfires in various Greek islands and elsewhere. Uh, there was feverish, and I use that word, forgive the pun, but feverish reporting uh, that it was just the heat of the sun causing undergrowth to spontaneously combust. It was just heat causing the planet to catch fire. But what happens? Now there are reports online, not really in the mainstream media, available if you want to go looking for it, of arrests all over those islands of arsonists or people being charged with arson. So it's increasingly likely that the wildfires so-called were set deliberately. But the same level of reporting does not happen. The, the, the sources that were terrifying us into believing that we were about to spontaneously combust, they don't really bother to tidy that up and say, oh, well, it looks as if those fires were set deliberately. And a person of suspicious mind uh, might wonder if those arsonists, if that's what they were, acted alone. You know, for want of good, healthy information that takes account of all points of view... People are left to speculate and, in many cases, to think the worst. So, were those people acting alone? Was it just people thinking out of mischievousness that they would set fires? What about if it suited someone somewhere to stoke panic about the climate by encouraging others to set fire to places? Places that where fire would not have happened had nature been left to run its course? What if, what if, in order to stoke the terror, to stoke the fear, others were encouraged to set fires? I just leave that question where it sits. And then, of course, more recently, there's the fires on Maui in Hawaii. The, the fires swept through prime real estate, uh, p- particularly the historic town of Lahaina. I've never been. I've never been to Hawaii. I've just seen it on the, on the movies and on the television. Uh, But Lahaina is apparently one of the most desirable places to live on Maui, in the whole of Hawaii. Well, that prime real estate's been reduced to ashes. And there's all sorts of speculation in the aftermath of those fires. Because for the longest time, much of that territory in and around Lahaina has been desired, has been sought after by others. But the incumbents... The, the, the people there were disinclined to sell and now the place has been levelled by fire. Okay, maybe those maybe there isn't a line connecting those those two dots, but you do have to wonder. I mean I read I read something online that the local uh, power company, the local electricity company might be getting set up to take the blame for for the extent of the devastation, but you know, we will watch this space Officially, the cause of the fires in Maui is still being investigated. But you have to wonder. There are questions that it's legitimate to ask and that there are answers to which we are entitled. All over the world, though, you know, in addition to wildfires, events are unfolding of geopolitical significance. And yet little seems to be being made of it on the front pages. Pakistan former Prime Minister Imran Khan has been jailed and and barred from seeking office for years to come if he ever gets out of jail. Now, Imran Khan, for the longest time, was a bona fide celebrity in Britain. He married Jemima Goldsmith and they were a, a celebrity couple. And then life took them both in different directions and Imran Khan uh, got into politics in his homeland of Pakistan and eventually served a time as, as Prime Minister. But he's been, he's been jailed, barred from office. And there doesn't seem to be the requisite amount of speculation 
and, and coverage about, about all of that that's going on. Imran Khan has denied all wrongdoing, but he's been jailed and other charges are hanging over him. And there's all sorts of worrying speculation about the bigger picture of which he is a part. Uh, it, it, would, it would appear that he annoyed the West, that he annoyed the United States of America, because he was, as they described it, um, aggressively neutral when it came to the war in Ukraine. Uh, he didn't come down as Prime Minister hard enough or fast enough on the side of Ukraine and against Russia. And, you know, shortly before his downfall, he gave a speech. He said, are we your slaves? Meaning of Europe, of the West. Are we your slaves? What do you think of us? That we are your slaves and that we will do whatever you ask of us. And he said, we are friends of Russia and we are also friends of the United States. We are friends of China and Europe. We are not part of any alliance. And that wasn't good enough. That was interpreted as aggressive neutrality, quote unquote. How can you be aggressively neutral? But but there you go. But there you go. Um, so he he, there, he languishes now in jail, with a with a future that is uncertain, to put it mildly. And yet, given what he meant in Britain, that seems it seems strange to me that no one is taking up the cudgels in his defence. You know, no one's speaking up to ask questions about what's happening to him. The, 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 the Pakistan Cricket Board, I think that's right, the PCB, recently re released a, a celebratory video about Pakistani cricket. And there's coverage of the 1992 World Cup that makes no mention whatever of Imran Khan. And he was the captain of the team. So the Pakistani Cricket Board have sort of deleted, have deleted Imran Khan. And yet, f for, for years, he was this towering iconic figure within the world of, of Pakistani cricket, world cricket, you know? So where has he gone? And given that he's been deleted in that way, why aren't people asking more questions? And I could go on and on, but I, I mean, I suppose it would be it would be incomplete to not mention what's happening in the in the West African state of Niger, where a government has been overthrown, and a military junta has taken over. What's happened is unconstitutional, but the the uh, the mood music from the population seems to be that they don't want anything to happen to the junta that has taken the place of the of what had been the constitutionally elected government. And the government that's gone was favoured by France and thereby favoured by the West. And I, mean, I should say it's not me interpreting, it's not me saying that the people of Niger favour the junta. They're, I'm quoting there a freelance journalist, producer and analyst at Channel Africa, SABC, called Ijak Como. And do you feel as if we're getting chapter and verse and the, the right level of detail about what is happening in that part of Africa. France obviously wants the government that it favoured returned to power, but it's worth knowing that although you know uh, uh, Niger had been French colonial territory, but Niger has been an independent country, that said, France still depended upon access to uranium from Niger for its nuclear power stations. Now, a lot of the French economy depends on its ability not just to have domestic electricity produced by its nuclear power stations, but also to export surplus electricity. This is a significant part of keeping the, the, the French economy its head above water. It needs and wants uranium, and so it wants the return of the government that made it straightforward for France to have access to that uranium. You know, so you start to see straightforward, bald economic desires uh, underpinning 
uh, the, the geopolitics in that area. Now, the, there's a block, there's an economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, which the West was hoping would respond to what has happened in Niger with one voice, but it hasn't. There are factions within ECOWAS, Mali and Burkina Faso, uh, have broken ranks and have said that they support the people of Niger and they support the junta. You need to look no further in terms of wondering what's going on than pay attention to the fact that Victoria Newland has been involved, acting Deputy Secretary of State for the United States of America. Victoria Newland, it was, who was deeply involved in the coup in 2014 that saw the democratically elected president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, run out of the country. And 2014 was properly, is properly described as the start of the war in Ukraine. Victoria Newland was up to her neck in the political machinations that saw the democratically elected president of Ukraine run out of town and replaced with another more favoured by the United States of America. Now, that's how up to her neck in that trouble she was. She's been over in Niger pushing for the return of the government favoured by France. And she's been, you know, she's been sent on her way by the junta and others in that country. But, you know, where Victoria Newland goes, regime change and war tends to follow. Anyway, all of it, from, from, the, from the front page news that's absent about Imran Khan, from the fear stories about climate crisis and a world on fire and the, and the world reaching boiling point, all of it, all of it demands questions. I invite all of us to keep asking the questions. <laughs>